we finished last class going over exactly how it is that we are a reflection of God. We are an image of God because we say, we are actually a part of God. And so when we can see that, we can understand the wider phenomenon better, that phenomenon being how it is that, uh, how it is that when we do an Avera and we do a sin, we actually disconnect one of the letters of God's name. We take it and we dislocate it, so to speak. So before we get to that, that's the next chapter. This chapter, we want to understand a little more clearly how it is that we are actually a reflection of God's name, and we're going to go through. So here we are. Today, we're going to go through a little crash course in how it is that we can see God's name within us and exactly how we can articulate that. It's very important because we understand that our body and our consciousness is a mirror, a map for how to see God, but sometimes we only get that in a general sense. Today, I want to take you through how we articulate that in every aspect of our consciousness and in every aspect of God's name. We're going to do that by looking at the four-letter name of God and also looking at how the ten spirut are articulated within that name and then, of course, within ourselves. That means that by looking within, I can have a more detailed picture a more animated and integrated picture of how I am a reflection of God. So here I want to start with God's name. You're seeing on your screen four letters, a yud and a hey and a vav and a hey. This is the name we'll often see in prayer books when we're praying. And sometimes we just read it and think of it as one of God's names. Every one of God's names corresponds to one of God's behavior. This name corresponds to how God is bringing the world into existence all the time. We see that in the name because hove, present tense, means to be. It's the same root. So that he and vav and he expresses that everything is coming to be through this name. Then the yud is continuous. So it's something that is ongoing can be conjugated with a yud in front of it. That first letter yud means continuous being. So this, this name, which we're going to call Havaya in this class, that is how God interacts with the world by bringing it into being in a continuous state. But now, how do the ten svirot, and for more detailed uh, class on the ten svirot, I'll refer people to my uh, intro to Kabbalah or Kabbalah for all class, where we go through in five weeks. Today, we're going to do a very cursory uh, description of them. Understanding how the Svirot map onto this name is the key to understanding more details of how this name articulates within us. And you'll see that it corresponds in just about every way to the shape of the letters, the number of value of the letters, and the name of the letters as well, because the whole thing is really flowing out of this one uh, creative act that God is doing. Going back to this map of how the Svirot appear within everything, in fact, I want to go through and give you a sense of what they each mean. This first bracket up on top is intellect. This bracket down here, the six on the bottom, is emotions. And finally, malchut is expression. And so going through, and again, I have a more detailed class, of course, going through. The first that we generally talk about is chokhmah or wisdom. That is the spark of how anything appears in the cosmos. So before something can appear in, let's call it God's thought, it has to have the potential to manifest, but it hasn't manifest yet. So imagine there's things that can't manifest. Something, anything is being brought into the potential to manifest, but still can't, hasn't yet manifest. It only appears as a point. It has no definition whatsoever. That is Chochmah, the ability to manifest without any manifestation whatsoever. Next comes Bina. Bina is where that point is now drawn out in a very lofty level. We're calling this God's thought and expanded multidimensionally so that it has, so to speak, space. Imagine, if you will, if I was drawing a picture and I put my pencil right on the paper. And before I drew, before I drew anything, what have I now drawn? I've drawn a point. I haven't moved my hand, and there may be a dot with some space, but imagine you could shave off the entire space of the dot. You're left with just a perfect point. 
if I ask you what picture am I drawing, am I about to draw, it could be anything. It could be anything I hear in my class. That represents a point that has the potential to be any drawing on a page. And that's the same thing as Chochmah. If you imagine something that has entered into the potential to express in the universe, but has not yet expressed, it now can be anything. That is Chochmah. Bina is the ability to expand that. So the point now has definition. So now it has length, breadth, and depth. And one more uh, piece we want to understand, which is Keter and Dat. So if you look at the top uh, of the Sirot and the middle one, those actually are one and the same. So in God's name, this appears as Keter. Keter would be the delight or the will that preceded that point of Chochmah. So before I put my pencil on the page to draw, I have the desire and the will to draw something and that proceeded and created that point. But from the point of view of the picture, it came not from one of the dimensions of the picture, it came from somewhere entirely else. My delight in drawing, my desire to draw, my will to draw, that doesn't appear on the page, but that is what preceded the, the point abstractly and that's what caused that point to begin. So we're going to talk about Keter in God's name in a moment, and that is where the point of Chochmah comes from. Those three, Keter, Chochmah, and Bina, are the intellect of God in God's name. And finally going on, we have six emotional flows. We call these the Midot in literature. The six emotional flows are mainly love and awe, love and kindness and strength, Chesed and Gevurah. And then there's other offshoots from those, which we won't describe today, Tiferet, Netzach, Hor, and Yesod. Those are the six, remember the name, the number six emotional flows that come out from God's intellectual flow. Intuitively, we understand this just like us. If I think about something all day, I'm going to have strong feelings about it. We had, I think, uh, the World Series last night. People that are thinking about baseball all the time have very strong feelings. You see it all come out in the game. Hooray for my team. And so it is with anything. When I have a strong emotion, it means that I have had a strong intellectual flow and connected to that. <clears throat> so that's God's six emotional attributes. And finally, malchut or royalty represents expression. So in this case, we're talking about God's speech, like a, a ruler that decrees by uh, speaking or even writing laws. Um, malchut is represented best by speech. And divine speech is an act of creation, as we know from Genesis. <clears throat> now we're going to flip to the divine name and see how these 10 attributes articulate exactly onto each letter of the divine name. And after that, we'll see how we can understand ourselves as a map of the divine name and how we, as a piece of God, as a lamp of God, have that divine name within us. So to understand how they map, first we want to understand the qualities of each of the letters. And let me say that letters are more like stages in an algorithm, functions within an algorithm. If we think of God as the creative force that is continuously behind the universe, that's a little like an algorithm that's running or a computer program that's running. Any algorithm or computer program has steps, stages, various functions, it has its own language, in fact. In the creation of the world that's ongoing, that language is Hebrew. So key to understanding how the Svirot map onto the divine name is understanding the function of each of the three letters in the four-letter name of God. Now we're going to go through them. The first letter is the Yud. The Yud is the letter that starts the four-letter name of God. A Yud is, we've been talking about a point or a dot, the word that is most like a dot or a point in the whole alphabet. It does not touch anything else. It is hanging in midair. It has very little shape. It really is just sort of a, a little blob, a little point, a little dot. Um, and it represents Chochmah in the alphabet, in the 22 letter uh, alphabet of the Hebrew language. So that starts the divine name and that corresponds to when anything is brought into being in the universe, it starts as a point of pure potential within divine consciousness. It hasn't emerged in any way at all, and it emerges just as a point of divine light. So that point we want to understand is Chochmah, 
And Chokmah very much is articulated by the Yud in the four-letter name of God. As well, we mentioned there's something called Keter, which is where Chokmah comes from. Keter, you can describe as will and also desire and even delight in its inner, innermost state. And so when I have an idea or think of something, it came from what gives me desire, what gives me delight, uh, what I want, and then that will occur to my mind to bring that point out. The same thing, that is a map of something happening within God. And so God also has something called Keter, which is God's delight and God's will. And from that, every point of Chochmah emerges. How is that illustrated in the letter? If you look, there's this little thorn, this little piece on top of the Yud. That represents the Keter from which Chochmah is derived. If we were talking about my drawing, if the first point when I put my pencil on the paper is the point of Chochmah, Keter is perhaps, like I said, my desire, my will to make the drawing. That point emerged from that, and yet there's nothing on the page that you could say this is where the point came from. It's completely in another dimension than the page. So if you like, the non-dimensional vector through which that point appeared, that is Keter. And that is the point of the Yud, the crown, the thorn on the Yud in the divine name. The next letter we want to look at is if I wanted to now take some point, but that point was much too lofty, much too high. Say, say it was a, a thesis from a great uh, physics professor, and I want to try and explain that somehow to someone with my limited understanding of physics, I'd have to draw it down, so to speak simplify it, convert it to something else, maybe use an analogy. There's many ways we can draw something down from one level to an entirely other level. We went over this last week. If you were to guess which is the letter that looks like a Yud that got stretched down, so now it's longer and reaching down. If we know the alphabet, what letter is that? Avav, Avav. And of course, that's also in the divine name. In the divine name, it is there as a function. So if I'm going to take this Yud, and stretch it down in some way to make it applicable. And down, of course, doesn't mean down towards the ground. Down means in an abstract way to a lower state. That is going to look like a vav, a yud that is stretched out. And you'll find every single letter, we could go through all 20, 22 letters, every single letter, as well as the, the final letters, their shape, their name, and their number corresponds in every multidimensional way to exactly their function in this creative process. Today, we're just going through these four letters. So Avav is very much Chochmah being stretched down. In my consciousness, what does that mainly look like? When the intellect is moving towards some kind of speech or action, that is through emotion. If something occurs to me and I don't care anything about it, what will happen? Drifts off, does not come down to be spoken about or acted on. If something occurs to my intellect and I have strong emotions about it, what will happen? I will start to say things. I will start to do things. It will be drawn down. So the Vav represents the six emotions that we looked at. Chesed, Gevur, Tiferet, Netzach, Chod, Yesod. What is the number value of Vav? Six. Six. Vav is six. Of course, it corresponds to the six Midot. And those are inter-included in the Vav within the divine name. So now we have the Yud in the divine name, which is that spark of Chochmah, which, by the way, also is mirrored in my spark of Chochmah. We have the Vav in the divine name, which takes care of the six Midot, right? And Keter is also included within the Yud, but there's still two pieces missing. If you are keeping track, we're missing Bina, which is intellectual expansion, and we're missing Malchut, which is expression. You notice I made the same motion with my hands when I did it, just, just intuitively, something like this. A hey is something like this. I'm taking a point and I'm expanding it in every way so that it's usable. Because an actual point, it has no dimension. It's not usable. I need to figure out what's contained in that potential and expand it so that then I can draw that down and express it. So what is the letter? We only have one left that might take a point and expand it in one two, three dimensions to give it volume, to give it a uh, definition. That's the last letter left, which is 
The hey. So let's let's look at the hey, the final letter in the divine name, and the final letter in uh, mapping out how the Svirot are articulated in the divine name. The hey represents expansion or expression. And you'll see this will apply both to God's intellect, so to speak, that that point of Chochmah that God brought into the universe without any expression has to expand before it can be drawn down. And then once it's drawn down, now it has to actually be expressed. The Torah uses the, the, uh, the, the um, metaphor of speech to describe God's expression. And our metaphor of speech is a beautiful uh, mirror of how God speaks to create the world. Let's look at the hey. If we're starting with the point of Chochmah, and now we want to expand it intellectually, this letter actually maps out drawing a point into one, two, three dimensions. So that point now becomes a cube, say, right? A point is zero dimensions. Start with my line on top of the hay is that first dimension. A point that is drawn out in one dimension is called a line. Now, what happens if I take that line and all those points move out in a perpendicular direction? That is that leg of the hay, right? That is this, uh, this vertical leg of the hay. That represents drawing this line down. So now I get what? Call it a square. So my point now has width which you could say is how it applies to multiple uh, areas, right? This idea about physics might also apply to relationships, might also apply to nature, might also apply to story writing, all these different ways that this idea could express. That's the breadth of the idea. And then the depth of the idea, that's how far I can draw it down, how far I can simplify it to, to more and more basic concepts, right? Take the very abstract concept and draw it down to more and more simple terms. And then to get a square, you need a third dimension. And the yud here on the bottom left represents that third dimension. If you can imagine it pointing not upwards on the screen, but towards yourself on the screen. Now you'll see that allows this original point to be drawn out into an actual cube. And that is the function of the hay. The hay takes that point of Chochmah, that is the yud, draws it out into a line by giving it breadth, draws it down again into a plane by giving it, uh, 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 sorry, breadth and then depth. And finally creates actual three-dimensional space by, by bringing it out into a cube. If you can imagine in your own intellect, that is the process by which any inspiration you have, you can, by using any intellectual process of categorization or a crystallization or analysis, expand that point into a three-dimensional idea. It also represents expression, as we'll see uh, in, in a moment. Is there, is, is there anything about why it's detached? Why the is detached? There is, there is. And that, that applies more to when we talk about thought, speech, and action. Uh, remind me, and I'll try and cover that. Mm -hmm. The part of the hay that's detached. That's a little that was my question. Is I still don't understand the three-dimensional aspect of it. I understand the you don't understand that uh, geometrically or don't understand that how the, how the yud does that uh, so the yud the yud i know we said it's a point but it's not a little on when you draw a hay it's like a little line mm -hmm. so imagine that line if this is the hay you get chink chink the line's not pointing that way the line's pointing that way you couldn't draw that on a page so we draw it this way but if you can if you can imagine the torah has every yud has a little, little, it's pointing out towards you. It's saying, not this dimension, not this dimension, the third dimension that's not on the page. Now it pops out and it's like, a, imagine like a fold out a greeting card, right? It goes boom, like that. So the yud's pointing this way in this, in this, in this analysis. Does that make sense? That's why, so that plane that's on the page, if you take it and I pulled the square out like that, now it, it's just created volume, right? Because now it's a square, it's a cube. Make sense? <clears throat> so moving on, we now want to look at the four letter name of God again, with all this in mind, so we can put the pieces together. So looking at these four letters, there's a first two and a second two that are distinct. The first two, the Yud and the He, this is 
let's call it God's intellect, which is within God, the vav and the he, that is God's emotions and expression, which is relating to creation. And if we go through, we see that keter, which we described, that is the thorn on the yud, which is what is leading God to have this point of inspiration. Chokhmah is the yud itself that represents the point through which anything comes into being, through which the universe is being uh, created. And there's your point. Now, Bina, that is the intellectual process which expands that point. That is that first hay. And we have uh, length, depth, and this third dimension, as we saw. So we have, we have now this point of Chokhmah has expanded it into a full divine thought concept, let's call it. Finally, God has six midot that express. That's the uh, six value of the vav, which brings that divine thought down closer to creation because God also has uh, aspects of love and awe, etc. And finally, God expresses all that through malchut, through the final hay. And if we want to talk about how the hay uh, expresses speech, there's a few ways of doing it. One is the name of the hay. Everybody say hay with me. Ready? One, two, three, hay. Now make the sound of what a hay makes. Ready? One, two, three. <sighs> what is that? It's breath. The very sound that a hay makes is breath. And where does speech come from? Breath. You have to breathe to speak. Breath is the source of speech. So breath, the sound of air passing through my organ of speech is what creates speech. And my organ of speech has how many openings that shape the breath? First, it passes through my throat. Ah, that's my throat. Then it passes through my palate, like, ah, yup, yeah, yup, yeah, yup. Yeah. You do that with your palate. Then it passes through your tongue, la, la, la. Then your teeth, ch -ch 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 -ch. then your lips. Pop, pop. So I have, count them, throat, mm -hmm. palate, lips, teeth, sorry, throat, palate, lips, tongue, and teeth. I have five openings in my vocal organs. And what is the number value of uh, hey? Five. Beautiful. Right? So in every way, we see number, shape, name. All these letters correspond exactly to their sub-functions within this larger algorithm of the divine name. We could go on now and show specifically how those express within us. We've touched on it. But the main point I want you to take from this uh, crash course is that when I look inside, when I understand my consciousness and how it works, it is a perfect map of how those 10 spherot also articulate within that divine name of Yud and He and Vav and He. And even more so by mastering how my flow coming from my desire and will going through my Chokhmah, my intellectual process, my emotions, and finally how I express, when I master that, it is in some way mastering a small piece of how the divine name is expressing in the world, and it is your immeasurably important puzzle piece that you have to add to the world. Thanks for joining us for this. Uh, if you, please look for more uh, videos in the future, and certainly if you want a better uh, explanation of the Ten Sefirot, I'll invite you to watch my class, Intro to Kabbalah. You mentioned that the first two letters are separated from the second two letters. The first two letters are within God. Second two letters are okay. Yeah, so the same as intellect and emotions and speech within us. And this, and we'll go through this inside. When I'm just thinking about something, like just my intellectual process, that's just me, how I am with myself, right? It's just, I can sit here and meditate and think about something and it doesn't really connect to, communicate to, or even relate to anything else. It really is just me, how I am with myself. What is an emotion? An emotion is how I feel about something outside of myself, right? Ice cream, mm, I love it. War, ooh, I hate it, right? So emotions start to emerge when I start not relating to me as I am within myself, but I start to relate to something outside myself, but it's still how I feel about that thing. Emotions lead to speech. Speech obviously is now starting to interact with something outside of myself and action even more so. So within us, and it's a little different with us and with God, and we may touch on that, generally intellect is the most me for myself, 
emotions are moving towards how I relate to others and expression, speech and action that is actually relating to something else. Same thing with God. The yud and the hey is God within God's essence, within God's self. There's no, there's no, there's no creation yet. Vav is the first thing that relates to creation because if God feels something, love and awe, that's about something outside God, which should be a, a paradox, right? There's only God. So that act of actually feeling something is created for God. That's why we say, Olam chesed yibaneh, right? For, for the world to, to, to exist, God had to create chesed because if there's only God, what does God have feelings about? It's just, it's all, it should all be only intellectual as God is within itself. So even once God has a feeling, that creates something. Whereas with us, it's different, as we'll see. But certainly, God's emotions and God's speech, that now is something relating to creation. Because when God speaks, it's implied that there's something God's speaking to. That's creation. So that, that, that dichotomy, that's within us and it's within God. Any questions? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back inside now. Good. Let's uh, let's go. We're on page two twenty, two twenty. So that was all us explaining all the ten sirot are included and represented in their source, the Tetragrammaton. So that second, that third paragraph, Michal Hayud Sirot Nichalot Vnim Razot B'Shem Havaya Baruchu. Right. That was that was my best attempt so far at trying to explain that concept. <laughs> That these ten sirot, they're included in the tetragrammaton. They're included as powers within us, and they're the best way to animate and understand how we are, in fact, a map of God. And now we'll go through with the Alter Rebbe's words, right? Ki hayud shehi b'china nikuda levad meramezet lechokmato iparech. The yud, which is a simple point extending at either length, at neither in neither length nor breadth indicates God's wisdom, the Sefira of Chachma. And so I hope as we explained that Yud is that point, that is something new that I wasn't aware of, that I'm now being exposed to in some way, or some, in this case, with God's creative name, something new that, the, that is coming into the universe that wasn't there before. And it has to come first as a point that has the potential to express not yet expressed. I don't have the text today. Okay. Uh, if you want, you can email uh, yes. uh, Helene. Helene? H. Deutsch. H D E U T C H. Helene? Helene at temple org, and she'll send you the, uh, the text. Let's go on, Noreen. Which is the state of concealment and obscurity before it develops into a state of expansion and revelation in comprehension and understanding. All right, so we now we understand this. Something appears in our consciousness as like an aha. We don't yet know what it is for a moment, for a brief moment, then it expands. So same thing in the cosmos. God's intellect enters the cosmos first as a point before it develops into any revelation. And we talked about where that point comes from and, and that thorn on the yud. Go ahead. The thorn above the yud indicates the supreme will, this being the level of paper, which transcends by far the level of kachma ila. Supernal wisdom as is known. As is known, right? So to get back to the metaphor of drawing a picture, if I were a being in that picture, right? Say, say an artist was drawing a landscape and there's some people in the landscape and say that artist is the creative force and, and I'm now a being in that picture. So I'm, I'm a picture person, right? I, I'm just, I'm in two dimensions. That's what I am. So anything that exists in that picture, tree, mountain, cloud, it started when the artist put their pen, pencil, paintbrush down on the page, it started as a point. And if I were in that picture looking at that point, and I say, where did that point come from? Well, it, it far, far transcends the level of Chochmi Allah. How you describe the creative drive in the artist that created that first point 
that began any aspect of that picture, how would you describe that to someone in the picture? Well, you're a picture person, but there's real people that have feelings and emotions and they get inspired and that inspiration leads them to try and paint something. And just before they start painting something, there's a moment where they, they touch our world and then the thing emerges from it. But to try and explain to me, a picture person who doesn't have a brain and I'm just in this two-dimensional world, where that point came from, you just, uh, <laughs> you know, it far, far transcends even the level of the point that has not yet emerged, right? So now try and project that to our world, right? Anything, any real thing in our world that's coming from the infinite, for us to try and understand the inspiration within the infinite that leads to any point of Chochmah, it's just, you have to leap so far beyond our ability to conceive of anything that all you can say is, it's just, it's Keter, right? That's why we, we never really talk about it in when we teach basic Kabbalah, because Keter, what do you talk about, right? It's outside of even our ability to nullify ourselves to the point that something new can occur to us. And, but beyond that, how do you get there? So that, that's how he describes it. Now we're going down past the Yud. Does it mean stimin? When the seminal point of Chokma is eventually amplified and revealed as something comprehensible to the concealed world, that is when it descends to the level and to the level of being. All right, so I'm still in the concealed worlds. Right in the yud and hay and vav and hay, that dotted line. I'm still here in the yud and hay. That's just worlds that that don't even have any reality or being. They're just godliness. But when that point within that world, that hidden world, is extended in breadth and depth, etc., that's the function of bina. That's the hay. I'm taking that point and I'm expanding it now. Vigam l'orech hamore. Oh, okay. And, and uh, Paula, why don't you read for us? It'll be the second paragraph. I'm not sure what second paragraph is then contained. Is that where we are? Yeah, and let's do all the way down to the middle of the page. Okay. It is then contained and represented in the letter He of the Tetragrammaton. This letter extends in breadth, implying a breadth of explanation and understanding, which is the function of Bina. The and letter also, Yeah. Go okay. ahead. The letter He also extends in length to indicate extension and flow downward into the concealed world. Right, so this is, as you said, it represents uh, breadth, which means this point of Chochma could apply to all these different concepts in reality, right? So say, say when God created um, the concept of time. Okay, so time is a perception of change. Time has incredible breadth because it can apply to any kind of change, right? It can apply to a relationship. It can apply to a solar system. It can apply to something growing. It can apply to something dying. Like time has incredible breadth. It, it applies to just about everything that there is, obviously. And then also depth, which means how can I not take that concept and make a simpler concept with it, right? Well, okay, how do you explain time to a child? Well, well, you know, look at the clock. The hand is here and then it moved here. Something changed, right? So just that simple idea that something will change or look at uh, the sun. Now it's here and then it vanished, it changed, right? So I could try and simplify the concept of time so that I can explain it to even a child. And so the hay is that ability to expand a point into many different parallel ideas and also draw it down into much simpler ideas, but all still, as you said, still into the concealed worlds. This is still all in the yod and the hay because it's all within God's intellect. So it has not yet engaged emotions and started to move towards uh, a relationship with creation. Yeah? This follow kind of what we did? Yeah. Yeah, just that much. Uh, Noreen, go ahead. 
In the next stage, when this extension of flow are drawn still lower into the revealed world. So we've expanded it. And that expansion, as the Hay says, does involve some drawing down, but only still within the hidden worlds. Now we want to draw it down into the revealed worlds, which, by the way, is not my cup of coffee and, and the room and the microphone. It's not the physical world that we see. Revealed, as we said last week, just means revealed in that they have some identity that can be um, pointed at, say, as independent from God in some way. So the hidden world is just godliness, really. The revealed world is still spiritual worlds that you and I don't see with our physical eyes, but they are revealed as in these angels and these beings and these phenomena, they have, you know, some kind of character that is outside of just within godliness. We're going to get to the point where you're going to explain why the last day falls out. Why the Yud has a, why the Yud has, why the Yud is separate? You know, when there's, when the, oh, when get the last page. that's next week. Okay. That's chapter five. <laughs> that, no, this is, so, right. we're learning this. Yeah. So that we understand yeah, yeah, and when, when we see, oh my gosh, when I do that, now the hay, God's hay gets dislocated and we, the shudder runs through us and we're horrified that we would ever have considered sinning, right? That's what I get to. But to understand that, to get to that point, you got to really understand this. The first, the first two words. Huh? The first two parts. Uh, so, no, this whole concept. Oh, yeah. okay. I, I want us to naturally. You understand the first two parts. No, no, no. You're in the first, but you understand that's also true. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, even the whole thing. So the point of learning this is to then understand how, when we function in our map, we dislocate the hay in God's name. And so I want us, when we look inside, to really also see not just small ash, but see, ah, it's Hawaii. It's God's name is happening inside of me. And I'm an actually, I'm a piece of that. I'm not just, I'm not just a photocopy that was now put here in a body. It actually is a piece of God's name that will affect God. So I will start to see myself as a very holy space inside where I want to be mindful of what I do, how I speak, how I express, what I feel, even what I think, right? Uh, so now we're flowing down to the revealed world, so to speak. This is the analogy is our emotions, how we feel about things outside us. hadam <laughs> Um, yeah, go ahead, Dan. Which may be compared by way of analogy <clears throat> to one who wishes to reveal his thoughts to another through his speech. This extension is contained in representing the final letters Vav and He of the Tetragram. So as we explained, that Vav and He, that represents... Uh, in God, it actually represents um, emotions and then expression. And for various reasons, in us, the Alter will say it actually represents speech and action. And we may have time today to cover that. Why ki havav mora al ha hamshacha mil mala lamata? So the letter Vav, which is shaped like a vertical line, indicates downward extension. Right, so as we said, the Vav is taking that Yod and stretching it down, right? And you can take that Vav and you can use it for the whole hay, can stretch the hay down too. It's just, it's the function of stretching down. And that stretching down appears as six midot in God. It appears as six emotional flows in us because we're, we are a map of that. You kind of skipped over that a lot. You really haven't talked too much about. Yeah, that's because, that's because Ketar and Dada are the same thing. So when, when, when Dat is in the ten Sirot, Keter is not there. When Keter is in the ten Sirot, Dat is not there because it really is um, a super conscious and conscious expression of the same one Sphira. Right. I thought Keter was more unexplainable, so beyond our comprehension, but Dat is more of an action that takes place after you after you've, we yeah. We thought of it always as a combination of Bina and Chachma. Right. Well, it's that, yeah, it's that too, it's that too. Yeah, so, so uh, let's, let's, take, let's take a detour. Yeah, okay. yeah. so dot is, dot is you know, focus and connection to an abstract concept so that you could have emotions. Right. So dot means I've gone through, had inspiration, I, I've 
expanded it with Bina. Now I say, ooh, I'm connecting to it and that will give me emotions. Whereas if that's not there, I'm just having abstract daydreamy thoughts and they're gone. I have no emotions, right? So that it sounds like it's not the same thing as character. It's that is the conscious expression of something that is above consciousness. Because how do I decide what that occurs to my intellect I focus on and connect to? And how do I decide what that occurs in my intellect I just don't connect to and have no feelings about, right? That is the conscious result and expression of something that actually is above Chokhmah, because really, if say I have thought A and thought B, intellectual concept A and intellectual concept B in my intellect, what's deciding that A, I'm going to profoundly feel something about a connect to, and B, I'm going to whatever. It actually is what I want generally. It is what gives me uh, delight and what, I, and what I desire and what gives me delight, right? So when I look at dot, it actually is the conscious expression of the desire that precedes Chokhmah. And that's why certain, certain sparks of Chokhmah will attach to me through dot. And certain sparks of Chokhmah, they really didn't come from a deep place of Keter. So dot is not firing. So that's why they really are. It's one phenomenon. But that phenomenon has a super conscious source and a conscious flow, right? So in Kabbalah, you either talk about dot. Or you talk about Keter because they really are one sphere. Okay. It's just they have they have they have like a binary, they have a binary expression. Okay. Yeah. Where were we? Vegam. Hamshachat zo hi alide midat chasta bitavo usha midotav ha kiroshot hani chalot bedera klal be misbar shesh sheva pasuk lacha hashem agdulav bechulu. Uh, yeah, Paul, if you take this one for us. Where am I again? <laughs> also, also this downward, chapter 4, 222. Okay, wait a minute. Also, this downward flow, is that the right one? Yeah. Into the revealed worlds is effected through the divine traits of benevolence and goodness and God's other holy traits. Included in, oops, included in general terms in the six attributes, the numerical equivalent above in the verse, yours, O God, is greatness, until yours, O God, is sovereignty, but not including it. So here I have on the screen the verse that the altar is talking about. So we heard that a million times when we take out the Torah. Why do we sing it? Because God's emotions are now flowing down to us. The Torah is God's intellect. And now these emotions are flowing down in the form of laws and, 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 uh, and, and uh, traditions, etc. Right? If you go through, this actually is also a map of the divine name or of the Midot in the divine name. To you, Havaya, like, so there's two yuds, that's a shortening of the yud and hey and vavane. So to you are all these emotions. Gedula is a, a synonym for chesed, right? God's greatness is God's love. So gedula is another name we use for chesed. And then, of course, we have gvura, the actual name, tiferet, netzach, hod, my gosh. These are the midot, right? Right in order. Kichol bashamai varats, that's, that's uh, yesod. And lecha, arashem amam lecha, that's malchut, right? Mam lecha is kingship. So this could be seen as a beautiful poem with all kinds of emotions that, that, we should, that we should love God and fear God. God's the greatest. But also it's a, a, a formal map of the same thing we just looked at in terms of the Midot, right? So, so that, is, that is the downer flow. That is the Vav as well. This is mapping out the Vav of how all these emotional flows are causing God's intellect, which is now expanded, to move down towards creation. I'm looking for a good place to stop because we're a little past time. Let's go, just two more. Ki midat malchuto yit barech nikret b'shem devar Hashem, k'mor shakatuv b'asher devar melech shilton. For his attribute of sovereignty is called the word of God, and speech is not more than the will than spiritual emotive attributes, as in the verse, wherever the word of the king holds sway, supernal speech then is related to malchut, 
right, so I'll need to finish here, but next week we'll, we'll finish up with how the hay represents speech. And you'll see the same thing we discussed. Uh, the hay is the sound of breath, is the five uh, oral articulations, the throat, palate, tongue, teeth, and lips. And in every way, it represents God's speech, the same way that uh, the hay is represented in my speech, in my own little map of the divine name. So uh, all this, like I said, all this is impressing and mapping out for us how we are a piece of God in every dimension, every aspect, because in chapter five, we're going to look at what happens now when I take this piece of God and I do something counterproductive. I do something that harms uh, the cosmos or myself or another. And it actually, as we said, has an effect on God's very name. So I'm not just affecting myself. I'm affecting the source of the whole cosmos. Thanks for joining us. If you'd, uh, if you'd like to join us in the future on Zoom or anywhere else, please email maya at temple-israel.org. It's been a pleasure. We'll see you next time on Gateway of Atonement.